Ships come here from all parts of the world to unload and pick up passengers and cargo. A harbor is a busy place, and the pilots, tugboat captains, and foreign ships make Port Everglades, Florida, a colorful mixture of activities and people. We'll find out what a harbor is all about today as Discovery visits harbor pilots and towboat men. Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, and welcome to Discovery. We're in Port Everglades, Florida, our deepest Atlantic port south of Norfolk, Virginia. It witnesses the passage of an amazing number of ships. Right now, there are nine large passenger ships and seven tankers and freighters in port. If every berth were filled, there could be as many as 30 vessels in port. For every docking, there's a sailing, and the average ship may stay here anywhere from 12 hours to three days. So there's constant activity in port. That's right, Jenny. The harbor channel is filled, particularly on weekends, with charter fishermen, sailboats, and small craft. There's a lot to keep track of. And berthing a massive vessel isn't as simple as parking the family car. The arrivals and departures are scheduled and recorded weeks, or at least days ahead, in the harbor master's office. Uh, Roger. Uh, thank you, Ornette, Captain. Okay. Once the captain of the awaited vessel wires the harbor master that he's offshore and ready for docking, the harbor begins preparations. What Everglades Harbor Masters are. In this case, the ship is the Michelangelo, a transatlantic ocean liner from Genoa, Italy. Because of her immense size, the Michelangelo will require a large berth and the assistance of all of the three tugs that service the port. According to procedure, she'll be met by one of the harbor pilot boats at a sea buoy just outside the harbor, where the harbor pilot will board the ship and take over her command until she's been docked. Hello, Captain Fagan. Uh, Cap, we got a confirmation on the uh, Michelangelo, 11 a.m. sea buoy time. Right. We'll go uh, berth number 16, starboard side two. Okay? Sure. Oh, yes. Notify them all. Thank you. This is Captain William Fagan. He's one of a two-man pilot team that works in alternating 24-hour shifts with another pilot team. Okay, Walt, let's go. The Michelangelo's due outside 11. It will be his responsibility to guide the Michelangelo through the harbor channel and dock her. The difficulty or ease with which this can be done will depend largely on his instructions to the three tugs. While navigating the ship to its designated berth, he must maintain constant radio contact with the tugs. Captain Fagan's many years of experience make this little more than a matter of routine for him. Each ship comes into Port Everglades under different conditions. Weather and visibility vary from day to day. The tide may be coming in or out, or a ship may be docking at night. All of these changeable factors will dictate the approach a harbor pilot must use to complete each docking. This clear and calm day should make bringing in the Michelangelo a relatively uncomplicated task that should take less than two hours to complete. After the Michelangelo has picked up passengers, Captain Fagan will guide her back out to the sea buoy where he will disembark and either return to the pilot house by pilot boat or wait in the pilot boat to meet another incoming ship at the buoy. While he's en route to meet a ship, the harbor master's office is busily alerting the tugs and dock linemen and preparing them to synchronize their activities. Okay, Don. Berth number three. Okay. Captain Ud Hope will skipper one of the three tugs assigned to the Michelangelo. The captain's background with the Navy and as a tackle with the New York football giants have given him the training and toughness that have served him for more than 20 years as a tugboat captain. 
There are officially three tugs working Port Everglades. Each one has two crews of four men each, including a captain. The tug's four-man crew lives aboard the boat during its 24 hours on duty. A captain, two deckhands, and a man in the engine room. James, we need seven linemen out here at uh, berth number 16. Uh, make it 10.45 a.m. Michelangelo. The harbor master's third and final phone call goes to the port's head line handler. He will in turn assemble the necessary number of men to work the docking from the berth. Like the other four harbor pilots of Port Everglades, Captain William Fagan has his master's papers and has captain ships in the Merchant Marine. When the pilot boat heads for the dredged channel leading to the open sea, the Michelangelo is still more than 40 minutes away from the sea buoy, the point of contact for which both of the vessels are aiming. Walter Sweat is the boatman. He's been a yacht captain, and so has his father. He knows the waters around Port Everglades intimately. The channel for which he's heading is dredged to a depth of nearly 40 feet, deep enough to accommodate all but the very biggest ships at sea. The tugs don't have to go all the way out to meet the larger ships. They can come alongside just before they are needed, when the ship has left the sea lanes and is in Port Everglades' own channel. Everything is ready here. The number of tugs used is generally judged by the size of the ship. And of course, the larger the ship, the more tugs. As a rule, two tugs are used. There are occasions when we use a third tug. Where we place them depends upon the draft of the ship, the berth it's going into, the current conditions at the time. To properly handle the ship and do a good job, it's absolutely essential that you know what the currents are doing. Once the pilot boat reaches the sea buoy, it alerts the Michelangelo that Captain Fagan is ready to come on board and assume command of the ship. Port Everglades pilot number two, whiskey X-ray 7308, following the steamship Michelangelo. Michael Angelo, please. As Captain Fagan boards the Michelangelo and is escorted to the bridge, the pilot boat will return to the pilot house to stand by for further duties. The first thing we do is, of course, proceed to the bridge and we ask the captain generally what his draft is and whether he's got a nerve in his compass so that we know what to expect when we're starting to head in the channel. There are three things that you watch for. The headway or the sternway that you have under the ship, how she is being affected by the wind, and how she is being affected by the current. The tugs ordinarily come alongside just as we get inside the jetty and they run alongside and put up their lines and make fast in the position that we have requested them to. And they stay alongside, maneuver, and do whatever we request until the ship is securely tied to the dock. When the pilot communicates with the tugboat captain, the tug captain acknowledges he has understood the instructions with one of several different kinds of blasts on the tug whistle. The number of blasts indicates how hard the tug will push or pull the ship. Since the tugs each have four forward speeds, one blast means the tug is using one quarter of its power, while four blasts would mean that it is going to use all its power. During the towing operation, the tugboat captain stays off the radio to keep it free for more important use by the pilot. The skipper of the tug is responsible for the tug until uh, he comes alongside the ship. Uh, make up two lines or one line, headline. Then you are no longer responsible for the ship. 
because you're only assisting. The pilot sees the overall picture, and so you uh, have to be sure you're doing just exactly what he says. While the tugs and the pilot are working together like a drill team, there's another part of the operation at dockside. This pickup truck is a familiar sight around Port Everglades. It's the harbor master's truck. It's on hand every time a vessel docks. The harbor master is responsible for making sure that everything goes well at dockside. The right number of line handlers must be waiting. As the tugs ease the ship into her berth, the line handlers secure her. Only after the pilot has determined that she is safely berthed will he release the tugs for their next assignment. One long blast followed by two short ones means all done. It's the tug captain's acknowledgement that he has been released by the pilot. But passenger ships are just part of the story. There are also tankers and freighters, motorized vessels and barges, and once in a while, something really out of the ordinary, like a ship called Trumpet Fish. We'll find out more about that in just a minute. When a large liner comes into Port Everglades, she requires the assistance of all three harbor tugs. However, the average ship that calls here needs only two tugs, and a few need just one, or perhaps none at all, depending on the ship's weight and number of propellers. Every day, ships come here carrying vast amounts of cargo. And Bill, about 1,500 ships a year call at Port Everglades. They come from seven continents, and at any given time, the port's 27 berths may contain lumber ships from Norway, oil tankers from Aruba, freighters from Japan, and liners from France or England or Italy. The ships of 50 nations make a temporary home here every year, whether they're cruise ships making their way back and forth from the Caribbean on a regular schedule, or unscheduled ships stopping off for needed repairs. Every ship which comes into the port must have an agent to handle a seemingly endless number of large and small details. The agent may be the ship-owning company itself, or it may be a private firm which contracts with the ship owners to look after things while the vessel is in port. If a crewman needs medical attention or the ship's purser needs money changed, that's the agent's department, just as it's his duty to see that food stores are provided and that water is taken on board. From the air on this particular day, the harbor appears to be unusually quiet. Many ships on the preceding day have discharged their cargo, or have acquired new freight and have departed during the night to various ports around the world. Days such as this one are rare at Port Everglades, but work continues behind the scenes to prepare for the heavy traffic that's anticipated during the forthcoming weeks. The harbor facilities can fill up as quickly as they can be emptied and periods of apparent quiet are evaluated as nothing less than the calm before the storm. And it isn't long before the harbor receives its first guest. Being the comparatively small vessel that it is by Port Everglades standards, this submarine won't require a tug escort to berth it. For Captain Fagan, docking his submarine is quite different from bringing in the Michelangelo. Without the assistance of tugs, she must dock under her own power. If the water were rough, her instability might make it impossible to dock her. Fortunately, today, that is not the case.
while she's in port, the submarine will be in good company. Her neighbor is the legendary Queen Elizabeth, one of the most luxurious ocean liners to have ever traveled the Atlantic. Because of her extreme size, the harbor channel at Port Everglades had to be deepened to bring her through. In the modern world of rapid air transportation, ships of this size have become too expensive and impractical to operate as anything but tourist attractions. The Queen Elizabeth now serves those who desire a window to the past to see what it must have been like to travel leisurely and luxuriously. Her final home will be Atlantis 21 a resort complex being built in Hollywood, a mile south of here. But for the moment, she rests here in Port Everglades, taking up berths 26 and 27. Bringing the Elizabeth in here a little over a year ago required six tugs and took three and a half hours. It was probably the hardest task ever faced by the harbor pilots and the tugboat men. We'll visit one of those tugboat captains at his unusual home, and we'll do that in just a minute. Captain Ud Hope spends most of his time on the water, though he seldom goes to sea. He works a 24-hour shift aboard one or another of Port Everglades tugs. His home life is also free of grass and sidewalks. He lives on a houseboat, which he and his family built over pontoons. There are six children in his family, but only four of them live at home just now. The two oldest girls are married. At home are 11-year-old Anna, Edward, 14, Oscar, 17, and Skip, who is 19. Until work on the houseboat has been entirely completed, the Hopes pay constant attention to its maintenance. We started building a houseboat a little over two years ago, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed building it. The boys learned a lot about wood construction, my wife learned about wood construction and fiberglassing. Uh, I learned more about my children and my wife, what they could do. Uh, matter of fact, I found out that I very much underestimated them. Uh, our houseboat we built, very much the biggest one that any uh, family has ever built, and the whole family built it. And we got a lot closer building it. And so uh, now we're enjoying it a lot more too. When Eddie Hope isn't at school or at home, he can often be found helping his father on the tugs. Captain Hope took an interest in the sea at an early age, and he believes that with the right exposure, Eddie will be able to appreciate and learn from experiences in the harbor that will benefit him during his entire lifetime. A little bit more left. Just easy, so don't come around too fast. Okay. Reach over and stop the boat. That's the boy. Eddie, he doesn't quite know what he wants to do yet himself. One moment at his age, he wants to be a tugboat man. Another moment, he wants to build airplanes. So uh, I believe though the kids, when they grow up, uh, once they make up their mind something they like, that's what they should pursue and do. And I'll enjoy life beside the job. Although both Captain Fagan and Captain Hope earn their livelihoods at sea, Captain Fagan chooses to relax on land. His home is a convenient five minutes from the pilot house. After having going to sea for so long, and then coming ashore, there probably were times when I felt very closed in by the house and the immediate neighborhood and cars and whatnot. But I've adjusted myself and become accustomed to being ashore, so I don't feel it any longer. If anybody asked me about going to see whether I thought it would be advisable, I definitely would give them a yes answer. You can make a good living 
you have a good chance for an advancement. And of course, there's always a spirit of adventure in the visit to different ports and foreign lands. Scheduling and synchronizing the activity of Port Everglades is a complex operation that requires elaborate planning. The men who move the port must be prepared to often sacrifice their personal comfort to meet the most extreme demands. But to men like Captain Fagan and Captain Hope, working Port Everglades combines the best of both possible worlds a life at home on land, and a life on the sea. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you enjoyed meeting the harbor pilots and towboat men here in Port Everglades, Florida. If you'd like to find out more about ships and the men who sail them, and harbors and the men who work them, then ask your librarian for any of these books. Ocean Challenge by Robert Kars, Great American Harbors, also by Robert Kars, and this book, Ships of Commerce, by C.B. Colby. Be sure to be with us next week for another exciting adventure as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Production Unit's domestic transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.